dear students in the last class we are discussing about thermal energy storage system under the module energy storage systems today we are going to discuss something on different energy storage systems which falls under mechanical energy storage so as we say mechanical energy storage it includes primarily compressed air energy storage system then pumped hydro energy storage system then flywheel energy storage system so before we go into the details of all the components is working principle let us see at what condition this energy storage system can be employed so this figure was shared in the last class also but here our attention is to know like this mechanical energy storage systems when to use okay for pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage system which is large scale is for large storage of power which is in the range of about above 10 megawatt to about 1000 megawatt which is represented here in this two and also you can see the energy storage in this two schemes also we have flywheels here which is used when its capacity or power output varies from about uh, close to 1000 kilowatt to about 0.5 megawatt and this is normally used like flywheel for short duration energy storage system okay but other two compressed air energy storage and pumped hydro energy storage system can be used for large duration energy storage systems and at the same time no amount is also very very high so now let us start with compressed air energy storage system so it looks something like this it comprises of compressors it may be single compressors or maybe multiple compressors then we have motor generator set so during the time of charging the system will work as a motor and during the time of generation this mg set will act as generator and we'll have turbines when we use compressed air when it exiting from the compressor it carries heat so we can have some such kind of provision to store the heat in a pebble beds and then we can store the compressed air in natural gas cavern or maybe salt cavern right and when we need to use the energy then we have to have constant head compensating pond which will press it and air will pass through the peg bed and then it will expand the air turbine and we can produce electricity and under the condition the system will work as a generator so here logic is mostly two third of the turbine work is utilized in compressing the compressed air that means this much of air is consumed by the compressor only one third of the turbine work is utilized for generation of electricity but if we can use the energy which is available during the off peak hours then this compression work can be reduced significantly because if we have operated the system at night times and the next day morning we can use the system without operating the compressor and turbine will be generating electricity right so 
what we can say that during off peak hours excess energy is used to compress air and store it in reservoirs, maybe aquifers or caverns. The stored energy is then released during periods of peak demand by expansion of air train and air turbine. And when air is compressed for storage, its temperature will rise according to the formula given here T2 is equal to T1 P2 by P1 n minus 1 divided by n. So, if we draw this enthalpy versus entropy curve and if we draw this to different conditions and if we write this is 1 this may be 2 s this may be 2 and this may be isentropic compression. compression and this is the actual compression. So, isentropic compression means entropy is constant. So, here if we have to know the temperature at this 2 or maybe 2 s then what we can write 2 s by T 1 is something like P 2 by P 1 if this is at P 1 and this is at P 2 and if we know the n value for air which is about 1.4 for air. So, if you know this then from here we can find out what is T 2 s. Also we can find out what is the efficiency of compression or isentropic efficiency of compression. So, it may be something like H 2 minus H 1 here H 2 s minus H 1. Okay. So, these enthalpies are functions of temperature. So, what you can write finally T 2 s minus T 1 is T 2 minus T 1. Okay. So, if you know the temperatures at this point then you can find out what is the isentropic efficiency of compressure. Right? So, this T and P are absolute temperature and pressures and 1 to refers the before and after compression and n is the polytropic exponent for the non reversible compression process. Normally this compressed air energy is stored at very high pressure ranging from maybe 40 to 100 bars at near ambient temperature. A large number of studies have shown that the air could be compressed and stored in underground high pressure pipings, where pressure may vary from 20 to about 100 bars. And that eliminates geological criteria and makes the system easier to operate. So, we will have three different kinds of reservoirs. So, it may be salt cavern or maybe natural gas cavern or it may be aquifers or it may be hard rock caverns. So, the salt caverns used to store petroleum products in the past and it is stable under compressed air storage loadings for the duration of the plant life if we store compressed air. And this aquifers necessarily occurring porous rocks formations where you can store compressed air. And hard rock caverns, it's a artificial reservoirs, we can make this kind of reservoir to store compressed airs. And these underground reservoirs are sensitive to pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. So we need to think about how to tackle this situation. So, now if we have to tell about its classification primarily compressed air energy storage system can be classified into two categories 
diabetic storage and adiabetic storage. So, what is diabetic storage? If the heat of compression is allowed to dissipate, additional heat could be added by fuel combustion to retain high storage efficiency, but results in extra expense and maintenance problem. So, if we see the configuration of diabetic system, so when we have excess energy or power, so we can run a motor and this motor will run the compressor and then we have compressed air which is stored in a cavern. And then when required, this stored compressed air is allowed to pass through a combustion chamber and then heated fluid will run the turbine and we can generate electricity. So, here we are not storing the heat of compression. So, we have air cooler, maybe we can use the heat for other applications, but here we need to have additional combustion chamber to raise the temperature of the compressed air. And which is done maybe at night time when we have extra energy and during the time of requirement we can release the compressed air and use it for power generation. In the adiabatic case what happens heat of compression may be retained in the compressed air or in another heat storage medium and then restored to the air before expanding through the turbine and which results in higher storage efficiency. So, we can demonstrate in this figure when we have extra power or during the off peak hours we can run a motor and motor will run the compressor and then this compressed air which carries heat as well we can store in the heat storage medium maybe pebble beds or some other mechanism and then we can store in the cavern and when required we can use that heat by flowing the air through this heat storage medium and then it goes to the turbine. So, if the temperature is not sufficient then we can have one heat exchanger to exchange heat and same system we can use for maybe diabetic system if we do not allow the hot gases to store or hot air to store in the pebble beds. Otherwise, in this adiabatic system, we normally store the heat in a pebble beds and then when we are releasing the air, then it will pass through this heat storage tank and then it will expand in the turbine and we can generate electricity, right. So, this plant is the first compressed air energy storage system which was installed at Hunterhof, Germany in 1978 and its plant capacity was 290 megawatt and this plant was designed by Brown Bovary. Okay? So, you can see here in this plant we will have three compressor with intercoolers okay? and then we have heat exchanger to take the heat because in this system this thermal energy is not stored and then compressed energy is stored in a reservoir and then when compressed air is required it is released at about 46 bar storage it more than 46 like at 50 bar but the release is at 46 bar and then it pass through a heat exchanger. So, this heat is coming from the turbine exit and then it goes to the turbine and also we can have a combustion chamber to increase the temperature of the air and that can be expanded and produce electricity. And of course, we will have two turbines high pressure turbine and low pressure turbines in between we will have combustion chamber. So, maybe natural gas is used for generating heat in both the combustion chambers.
So, mass flow rate was maintained something like 0 0.9 to 0.25 times m1. So, m1 is here, it is the during the discharge time and this is the filling time m2 and you can see all the temperatures and pressures. So, inlet is at ambient 1 bar and 10 degree C in the first compressor, then it is compressor second compressor, then from second to third compressor. So, intercooler is there that means cooling effect will be there so that this turbine will not destroy and finally, generator will be connected here and we can produce electricity of about 290 megawatt in this system and exit temperature of the turbine is about 400 degree C. So, it has got huge potential and that is how this heat is exchanged and that is used in expansion in the high pressure turbine. Okay. So, this system uses two salt cavern with a total volume of 300,000 cubic meter and at a depth of 650 and 800 meter from the earth surface below ground. The system composed of a motor generator set and it is a three stage compressor with intercoolers and two stage gas turbine with reheat. So, this is two stage gas turbine with reheat. So, this is the reheat and the storage for 8 hours daily and generation for 2 hours. So, charging ratio is about 1 is to 4 and uh, it is a good availability and good reliability of this system has been already confirmed. After that, there are many more developments on this compressed air energy storage system. So, like 110 capacity which was installed by Macintosh. So, maybe we can solve one problem to get an idea how this system works and how we can design a compressed air energy storage system. So, this problem goes something like this. In a compressed air energy storage system, the average air flow into a reservoir of 64,000 cubic meter is at a rate of 8300 cubic meter per hour. So, we have air flow is which is represented by Q is 8300 cubic meter per hour and the reservoir volume is 64000 cubic meter okay. and air enters at 1 bar. So, that means P1 is 1 bar and T1 is 20 degrees C. So, I will plot this maybe I can write T because enthalpy is a function of temperature I can write this way as well 1. 2s2 and this may be at p2 this may be at p1 okay and uh, leaves at 100 bar that means p2 is 100 bar and polytropic compressor efficiency that means eta c is given as 70% if the peaking turbine efficiency is peaking turbine efficiency is 60 percent and air is stored in a cavern at 100 bar and 20 degree C. Okay. So, at this bar we are storing and we need to find out the compressed air temperature storage time then total energy storage in megawatt hour the total energy delivered by the peaking turbine and CP of air then gamma velo exponent and gas constant of air is given to us. So, let us solve this problem by first considering the efficiency of compressor that means polytropic efficiency of compressor which is defined as eta C is 
we have T 2 s minus T 1 then we will have T 2 minus T 1 this may be equation number 1. So, here only we know T and then efficiency value we do not know T 2 and T s. So, in order to find out T 2 and T s then we know the expression T 2 s by T 1 is equal to pressure ratio P 2 by P 1 then we will have gamma or n we can write gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, this will be like 100 divided by 1 then it will be 0 0.4 1.4. So, if we do the calculation then it is found to be about 3.7273 and again we know T 1 which is equal to 273 plus 20. So, we have to convert to Kelvin multiplied by 3.7273. So, it will be comes out to be 1092.113 Kelvin. So, this is T 2 s. So, once we know T 2 s then we can find out T 2 by using this polytropic compressor efficiency right. So, by substituting the value of eta c which is 0 0.7 and T 2 s is 1092.113 minus T 1 is 20 plus 273 it will be 293 and T 2 we need to find out and T 1 is again 273 right. So, if we okay, let me this T 1 so this will be requiring some time T 2 minus T 1 will be about 1141.59 is the temperature difference right. Then we can find out what is T 2. So, it will be 1141.59 plus T 1 is 293. So, it will give a value of 1436.74 Kelvin right. So, now we know all the temperatures ok. So, here compressed air temperature we have been asked to calculate. So, this is the answer A ok. So, now we need to find out the specific volume of air at 100 bar. The specific volume of air because we need to find out the mass flow rate ok. So, by using this expression what I am going to write we can find out what is the specific volume of air at 100 bar and 20 degree C. So, we know P is equal to rho R T ideal gas equation then specific volume is nothing but 1 by rho R T by P. So, if we substitute those values R is given to us is 284.75 and temperature is at 20 degree C it will be 293 and pressure is at 100 bar. So, 100 bar means 100 into 10 to the power of 5. So, here it is kilo. So, if we make it like kilo Pascal it will be something like kilo Pascal right. This is Newton per meter square. So, Pascal is Newton per meter square. So, that means we can have 100. So, here what we will get here is 84.09 into 10 to the power of minus 4 cubic meter per kg. 
So, this is the specific volume of air at 100 bar and 20 degree Celsius. Now, we are going to calculate the mass flow rate. of air into the cavern. So, here we know the mass flow rate 8300 which is cubic meter per hour then we have to convert it to second. So, it will be 3600 now it is cubic meter per second and then we will have specific volume which is calculated now it is 84.09 into 10 to the power of minus 4. So, this will be something like we will have 274.18 kg per second right because we know discharge of air was kg per hour. So, we have converted to second by dividing 3600. So, this is second and here is cubic meter per kg. So, this was cubic meter. So, then we can take this kg up. So, this will goes off and finally, what we will have kg per second because this value what we have given to us in cubic meter per second not kg per second right. So, that is how we can get it kg per second fine and this is nothing but the mass flow rate of air into the cavern. So, once we know this mass flow rate then we can calculate the rate of energy storage. The rate of energy storage will be mass of air multiplied by specific heat of air multiplied by temperature difference T 2 minus T 1 ok and this is something like mass flow rate of air. So, if we substitute the values like 274.18 multiplied by specific heat of air is 1005 kilojoule per kg per degree Kelvin and temperature difference what we have calculated before is 1141.59. So, if we do the calculation it is comes out to be 314.556 megawatt. Okay. Now, what next we can do is the storage time. So, rate of energy storage is known to us. Now, how much time it will be requiring to store this much of air in the storage tank. So, it will be something like volume is known to us 64 thousand cubic meter divided by we will have 8300 because this is the volume of the reservoir and this is the volume flow rate which is in volume per hour. That means, meter cube is the volume of the reservoir then meter cube of gas per hour. Okay. So, it will be hour. Okay. So, how much will get here is about 7.71 hour. Okay. So, this much time is required to store the air in the cavern. Right. So, once you know this time then what you can calculate is the total energy stored. Total energy stored will be 314.556 which is the rate of energy storage. So, multiplied by we will have 
7.71 and this is comes out to be 2425 megawatt hour. Okay. Since we know the peaking turbine efficiency, then we can find out the amount of energy to be delivered by the turbine, which was the last question answer. Total energy delivered by the peaking turbine. which will be 2425.22 multiplied by picking turbine efficiency 60 percent. So, we can multiply with 0 0.6. So, it will be 1455.13 megawatt hour. So, this is the final answer. If we consider the picking turbine efficiency is 0 0.6, then we can get the energy output of 1455.13 megawatt hour. Okay. Now, let us move to the second mechanical energy storage system. What is considered in this study is pumped hydro energy storage system. So, in this system, we will have upper reservoir, we will have a lower reservoir and in between we will have powerhouse and then this is the pen stop. Okay. And also sometimes we need a surge tank, normally it is placed here, this is surge tank. This surge tanks provide the reservoir of water that can be drawn upon when the load on the turbine suddenly increases also it take care of hammering effect. So, this arrangement is mostly suitable for large scale energy storage systems. So, energy is stored by hydraulic potential energy by pumping water from a low level into a high level reservoir during the off peak hours. So, we have energy during the off peak hours. So, we can leave the water from lower reservoir to the upper reservoir and when we need energy then we can release this water and it passes through this power house through generator. So, we can produce electricity. So, that is how it is written the water is returned to the lower reservoir through turbines whenever discharge of energy is needed or we need electricity. So, component wise we have upper reservoir then water waste like pen stock then we need pump. So, when we are lifting water it will work as pump turbine then motor we need generator and then lower reservoir which is shown in this plot. Now, we have to know how this power developed can be calculated to get an idea. So, potential energy stored by raising mass of water m to an elevation h is m, z and h. If we know the head difference between the upper reservoir and the lower reservoir, then straight away you can find out what is the potential energy stored. Of course, we need to know the mass of the fluid. The operating heads on the pump turbine in the pumping mode is HP and turbine mode is HT. And mathematically this can be represented by HP is equal to H plus H1 and H T is H minus H 1, where H is the static head and H 1 is the losses during flow. 
So we can define the pumping power which is represented by HP is equal to QP which is the flow rate of water multiplied by density of water then Z is the acceleration due to gravity then HP and this is the pump efficiency and turbine power we can find out by using this expression rho Z H T multiplied by Q T and turbine efficiency. So, this is for pumping water and this is for generating power releasing water from the upper reservoir to the lower reservoir that is the discharge which is represented in cubic meter per second. And that is how it is written Q is the volume flow rate and P is the density of water and eta is the density. P is for pump and T is for turbine. So, to give an idea say if we consider 1000 kg of water or liter of water raised by say 100 meter then how much energy will be stored. So, we can calculate the amount of energy stored. So, storage will be something like 1000 multiplied by rho into G 9.81 into H ok. So, this is equivalent to about 9.81 into 10 to the power of 5 joule or we can say it is about 0.2725 kilowatt hour of energy. Okay. That means what? We need large amount of water has to be lifted to a high head to get or to store more energy. Right? So, we can write large mass or masses of water must be elevated to sufficiently large height. to store large quantities of energy. Okay. So, we can visualize now. If we need more energy then we need to lift huge amount of water to a high head. Okay. So, while analyzing this we must notice that there are some losses. So, which are the parameters or components contributes to these losses? It is like motor and pump losses, flow losses during upflow, seepage into ground, leakage of water from pipes and equipment, evaporation during storage, turbine and generator losses and flow losses during downflow. And in this system we can term an efficiency which actually you know combines all the efficiencies of the components is called turnaround efficiency. So, it is defined as total energy output to the total energy input during surging and discharging cycle. So, in most plants the turnaround efficiency is about 65 percent. So, this is one of the plants which is still operating at Scotland. So, it is a crescent station of North Scotland hydroelectric board. So, you can see here its capacity is 400 megawatt electrical. So, this is the lower head and this is the upper head dam 
and you can see all those components and its head is about 364.5 meter that is a gross head and in this scheme pumping is carried out mostly at nights and weekends to meet daytime peak load on next day. So, this scheme is still operating successfully. Now, let us discuss about uh, flywheel energy storage system. Normally, this flywheel is used for short duration energy storage system. Now, since researcher has made significant progress in this system, now it is capable to store energy for longer period of time. But if we store for longer period of time, then its efficiency is decreasing with time. So, that is a concern we should look into in this kind of or this energy storage scheme. So, it looks something like this. This is magnetic bearing and this is the motor generator part and this is the rotor and we have Pecom pump as well and this is lower magnetic bearing and we have protective seal and here is the electrical connections. The flywheel energy storage involves converting electrical energy into mechanical energy by accelerating a massive rotor to high speed. So, this has to be rotated at very high speed and this will be stored and when required this will be released and generator will be generating electricity. This has got very fast response like five wheels offer rapid energy supply and absorption responding within milliseconds making them suitable for grid stabilization and short duration backup power. So, this is used in grid stabilization and also in internal combustion engines. And if we talk about efficiency and longevity with minimal energy loss due to friction, flywheels can reach high efficiency levels and advanced materials and bearings technologies contribute to large life spans and reduced maintenance needs. So, how it works like in charging mode during off peak hours the motor adds energy to the flywheel this is the motor adds energy to the flywheel and it will store and during peak hours the flywheel rotates the generator to supply electricity. Okay. So, it looks very uh, simple, but it involves a lot of design considerations like how are you going to design this rotor because it involves all those aspects of consideration of momentum inertia of the system. Okay. So, let us learn something more how this energy can be calculated. So, if we consider a flywheel here, so this is the axis of rotation and it is a rim kind. So, the energy content of a rotating mechanical system can be written as of a rotating mechanical system we can represent w which is equal to half i into omega square this may be equation 1 where i is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular velocity. Okay. And this moment of inertia 
is determined by the mass and the shape of the system or maybe the shape of the flywheel right so we can represent i is something like integration of x square dm x where x is the distance from the axis of rotation to the elemental mass maybe if we consider this is the elemental mass dm x okay so here in this case if we consider x is equal to r which is the radius of the rotor then we can write the expression for momentum inertia which is nothing but r square into m okay and if we use this expression in equation 1 then what we will have energy content of the rotating mechanical system is something like w r square m omega square okay or you can write w m r square omega square and this may be equation number 4. Thus the energy content depends on the total mass what you can see here total mass and the angular velocity okay so this is the angular velocity so angular velocity is more prominent than mass okay because it has got the second power so in order to obtain high energy content high angular velocity is more prominent right or more important than the mass of the rotating system or rotor system. The energy density you can calculate that means the amount of energy per kg and we represent is that W m. So, it will be something like W r square omega square. Okay. So, this may be equation 5 and W m is nothing but W by m. Okay. And also, if we are interested to find out in case of volume energy density, that means volume energy density, we can also express something like W v which is half rho omega square r square ok. Again this high angular velocity depends on the strength of the material. So, we need to select which material is having high strength because it has to rotate that very fast ok. Then we need to know the tensile stress if we designate the tensile stress stress as sigma in the rim then we can express sigma is equal to rho omega square r square. So, this may be equation number 7. Also, we can find out the maximum kinetic energy per unit volume, the maximum kinetic energy per unit volume which we can represent W v max which is equal to half rho max. Okay. So, this gives the maximum kinetic energy per unit volume. So, if the dimension of the flywheel are fixed, the main requirement is the high tensile stress. Okay. So, that we should keep in mind. 
So, there are some materials like glass, silica, carbon. So, glass is having strength of about 3.5 giga Newton per meter square and its mass density is about uh, 2500 kg per cubic meter. And if we compare with silica, it will be about 6 giga Newton per meter square is the strength and its mass density is about uh, 2200 kg per cubic meter. So, we need to select the best material which is having light in weight and it can provide high rotation. Now, we can express this W m max which can be k m by sigma max by rho. So, earlier expression we are using 0 0.5 that that was valid for only rim kind of flywheels and this is k m which is generic term. So, this will be varying with respect to the shape of the flywheel. Okay? Because if we consider say disc, say for example, we are considering disc here. So, this is the axis of rotation and this is radius and mass of the system is something like this. Okay? This is mass. So, each moment of inertia will be half into m r square, but if it is a cylinder, it is something like this and this is the axis of rotation and r is the outer diameter and small r is the inner diameter. Then its moment of inertia will be half of m r square capital R square plus small r square and if it is a what is called bar then its moment of inertia will be 1 by 12 L square if its length is L. Okay? So, this k m depends on the geometry of the flywheel depends on the geometry of the flywheel. Okay? Now, we can find out the stored energy in the flywheel, the energy stored in a flywheel which is nothing but kinetic energy is half i omega square. So, I can write half m r square then twice pi n whole square and then we can simplify something like twice pi square m r square then we have n square. So, this may be equation number, this may be A I can write and this may be B. Okay. So, here m is the mass of the flywheel, m is the mass of the flywheel which is known to us and r is the radius of gyration I can write and n is the rpm or rps revolution per second. If it is minute then we have to divide the expression by 60. Okay? So, the energy absorbed or it may be released by a flywheel between say speed 1 and speed 2, then how this equation B transforms, you can write this kinetic energy or you can say here is change in 
E or kinetic energy which will be something like twice pi square m r square then we have n2 square minus n1 square right. So, you can simplify it like twice pi square m r square it may be n2 plus n1 and then we have n2 minus n1 ok. Also we can express this in terms of a term called k s k s which is known as the speed fluctuation So, this is defined as n 2 minus n 1 divided by n ok. So, this n is nothing but mean of 2 speeds n 1 plus n 2 by 2. So, here you can write n 2 minus n 1 whole square divided by n 1 plus n 2 and already we know n is n 1 plus n n 2 divided by 2. So, then if we write the expression for energy absorbed or released by the flywheel between two speeds then equation C implies we will have delta E is equal to 4 pi square m r square k s then n square. So, this is equation number D ok. So, this k s depends on the desired closeness of speed regulation. For engines this k s value is in the range of 0 0.005 to 0 0.2. So, that way you can consider you can find out what is the delta E or energy absorbed or released by a flywheel between two speeds. Now, let us solve one problems in relation to the flywheel energy storage system. The problem goes something like a power plant is considering implementing a flywheel energy storage system to help stabilize the grid during sudden changes in the demand. The flywheel has a moment of inertia of 0.2 kg per kg multiplied by meter square and rotates at a constant regular velocity of constant angular velocity of 300 radian per second only to calculate the kinetic energy stored in the flywheel and the amount of energy it can be delivered if its angular velocity is reduced to 150 radians per second. So, how to calculate? If the angular velocity of the flywheel is reduced to 150 radians per second, we can use the conservation of angular momentum to calculate the energy delivered ok. So, we will have omega 1 which is nothing but angular velocity initial angular velocity which is 300 radian per second and omega 2 is the final angular velocity which is given as 150 radian per second. So, we know the kinetic energy expression which is nothing but half i into omega square. So, if we know change in kinetic energy then it will be somewhat like half into mass is moment of inertia is 0.2 kg meter square then we will have omega 1 square minus omega 2 square. So, if we substitute these values 0.2 multiplied by 300 square minus 150 square. So, this is calculated to be 6750 joule. The flywheel can deliver about 6750 joule of energy when 
the angular velocity is reduced from 300 radian per second to 150 radian per second. Okay? So, that is how we can store the energy and we can deliver when required. And also we can think of some kind of hybrid energy storage system which can couple wind energy, solar energy as the generation side because these are not continuous generating device. So, when wind potentials are there, but demand is less, so we can use that energy later on by devising a suitable energy storage system. Same is whole good for solar. So, these are the resources and we can go for pumped hydro energy storage system or maybe compressed energy storage system or we can hybridize both the technologies or maybe further we can go for maybe some kind of hydrogen generation and we can store that hydrogen for later use. So, that is how the stored potential energy will be utilized during the peak hours and part of the energy from solar PV plant may be utilized for generation of hydrogen using AEM electrolyzer which should be converted to electricity via solid oxide fuel cell because it will operate at high temperature. So, this kind of mixed mode is also possible as far as you no know, utilization of renewable energy and availability and maturity of technology is with us. Okay? So, with this we would like to summarize what we have discussed today including the kind of plants already in operation in the globe. Now, you can have thermal storage, molten salt, compressed air, then we have pumped hydro, there are many more plants which are already in operation in the globe. So, in this class primarily we have studied the working principle of mechanical energy storage systems which includes compressed energy storage system, pumped hydro energy storage system and flywheel energy storage system. It is found that for large scale pumped hydro energy storage system is most suitable because of its maturity. And of course, there are ample scopes of development of effective energy storage system at various scale based on the situation. I hope you have got an idea about all these three mechanical energy storage system. So, thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you. Thank you.